Hello and welcome to another lesson in the Age of Imperialism. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at the broad sketches of empire, the Dutch forays into Indonesia, the French and British disputes over North America, the opening up of China and the Opium Wars. And of course, last week we looked at the nuanced perspectives through the concept of empathy of those who fought in the uh, Sepoy Rebellion of 1857, or also known as the Indian Mutiny. And I want to use that as a bit of a springboard today for another rather large concept, which is that, oh, hold on, that of ideology. Can anyone tell me what ideology refers to? Yes, Hannah. Yes, that's a very good definition. Let me just expand upon that a little bit, and I'd like you all to write this down. An ideology is a set of ideas inherent to a political and or cultural body. So what we mean when we talk about the ideology of empires is the set of ideas that help propel them forward and hold them up, the justifications given to keep them going. Can anyone point to one particular justification? Yes, Mark. Loyalty, yes, that is an excellent example. And I would like, Hannah, could you just hand this one out, thanks? Thank you, okay. Just... I'm just handing out a series of artifacts that explain some of these ideologies we're looking at, but, but Mark's given a great example there with that of nationalism, which can, is contained on the first sheet. This idea of loyalty to the state. And of course, we looked at, during the Enlightenment period, last module, at this, this process of patriotism, this, this emerging statehood, where people of Britain no longer identified from local villages or regions, but instead as British at large. We see these emer this emerging idea of traits that are natural to certain parts of Europe. This idea that Britons are naturally democratic, the Germans naturally stoic and so forth. And with that comes the development of this idea of, of duty to the state, that the first duty of a citizen of the state is loyalty to it, that to fail the empire is to fail your fellow man and woman. And so nationalism really comes out of this sort of proto-patriotism, this idea that not only should you fight for your nation, but that you should be determined to do so, that you should be happy to do so. And I feel that's best demonstrated in the conflict of the Crimean War, which is known as the first major like, you know, battle of modern nations. And uh, there's a rather famous song that comes out of it, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to sing it to you. I oh, know. Uh, and it goes like this. It's, it's a British song. It goes, we don't want to fight, but by jingo if we do. We've got the ships, we've got the men, we've got the money too. I fought the bear before, and while we're Britain's true, the Russians shall not have Constantinople. It's a bit cheesy, but you, you, see, you see the meaning that comes out of this idea of natural loyalty. But we also see a lot of criticisms of this view during the period. We, we, we see, for instance, you've got a, uh, an, an image there, a satirical image, that shows that the nations of Europe like fighting over this this dead body of of a defeated China, uh, and and that's something I want you to keep in mind. This idea of dissent, this idea of critically examining uh, various ideologies, particularly in regards to this one, the white man's burden, which uh, comes from the uh, the title and theme of a famous poem by Rudyard Kipling. We're going to be doing a textual analysis of that, of that eventually. Uh, but essentially, it's this idea that empire is justified in its civilizing mission, bringing Christianity and manners and progress uh, to those barbaric, savage native countries, of, of bringing Christianity to South America, of bringing uh, technology to North America, uh, the, the native Indians there. And, and you see this, this idea constantly throughout empire, this idea that might doesn't just make right, that we are also there on a benevolent mission. And one of the most horrifying examples that comes out of this is that of the Belgian Free State under the control of King Leopold II. Does anyone know what I'm referring to here? No, that's not a problem. I, I would advise you to not look it up late at night. It's a particularly gory period in history. But essentially, the Congo Free State, located in Central Africa, was allowed to King Leopold II under the guise of being a humanitarian and civilizing mission. By the end of his reign, 10 million natives were dead in the exportation of ivory and rubber and various other resources. It's a particularly horrible period in history. And you can see there on your sheet also another satirical criticism of this view, 
this idea that the very inventor of the term white, white man's burden is simply being held aloft in, in Africa to view the destruction, to view the colonizing mission, that he is not doing the hard work. The last view I want to talk about is that of scientific racism. Can anyone give me an example? Uh, can anyone give me a definition, sorry, of scientific racism? Yes, Sharon. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have studied this in science already, but this really emerges out of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, it's sort of a twisted version of it, a, a malformed view that holds this idea that the survival of the fittest shall survive, that uh, the empires that are strong shall survive, the people that are strong shall continue, and those that perish, it's not a bad thing that they go, it was simply meant to be, it was simply, simply the natural thing. And we see that, sadly, in our home state of Tasmania during the Black War throughout the 19th century, where the native Aboriginal population is seen as naturally declining, that the survival of it is decreed that they were to go. And, of course, throughout the 20th century, those who, who know this period can know that there is a great deal of horror to come from this view. Can anyone tell me why it might be important to know these justifications, know these, these basic ideologies? Yes. Yes, exactly. I see what you've done there, Mark. You've linked it into the little the little criticism there, uh, which, as you can see, contains an image of the barbaric Irish. Yes, it justifies oppression, and that is something that we must recognise today. That is something that, in many ways, I would argue we have a duty to recognise today. It shows us, uh, as Hannah mentioned earlier, the boundaries, uh, the, the, the current socio-political historical environment, and knowing how it came to be that way. But moreover, as suggested, it also gives us reason to think critically about what we are told today, to really look at calls to action in our modern modern uh, world and really think critically about what exactly we're being directed to do and if it's really worth it. Okay, I'll get you to just form up in your tables now because I want to continue that line of thought into our first task. I'm going to be handing around a sheet for you to share, but I want you to mainly work on your own booklets. And what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at the arguments contained within these artefacts and looking at how these arguments are made and what elements they share with modern iconography and modern calls to action. Okay.